Hello, I'm Morgan Jorgensen, the Donor Relations and Events Manager for the Truman Library Institute. Welcome to Truman Trivia. Today, we're joined by Harold Ivan Smith, author of the book, Almost Everything Worth Knowing About Harry S. Truman, 33rd President of the United States. Harold Ivan will discuss his book and then lead interactive trivia using a selection of the book's many questions. Harold Ivan, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. There will be a 10 to 15 minute Q&A session immediately following the presentation and trivia. Questions can be submitted during and immediately following the program through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Now, it is my pleasure to turn the microphone over to Harold Ivan Smith. Good afternoon, or I guess it's evening in Kansas City, but people are from different places in the country and the world. And I'm delighted to have a chance, have this opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects, Harry Truman. What a gift to the world. And particularly right in this very moment. And you may go, well, like what? Well, if we go to 1918, Harry Truman is in Europe in fighting in France in World War I. And Bess is in this house that is behind me and she has come down with the Spanish flu. And there were days they were not sure that Bess would survive. Now remember they had been engaged about five or six years at this point. They were not youngsters, they were in their 30s. And Bess had been willing to marry Harry before he left for France and he was afraid that he might be maimed or injured in some way. And so he said, no, I cannot take that responsibility. Now, it's hard for us in this day of immediate uh, electronic uh, communication to realize it took weeks for them to get letters from independence to France, France back to independence. And I can't document exactly at what point Harry became aware that Bess had the Spanish flu. And he was just frantic. And many of his men in Battery D also had wives, daughters, mothers that were battling Spanish flu in independence. And I think it brings a lot about to where we are today in this time of uncertainty. Uh, at least we have the advantage of reaching out, whether it's email or text or Instagram or a phone call. And yet the torture, because Bess was afraid that Harry was going to be shot and die in France. And this going across the incredible tensions. And when Harry got a little note that Bess had walked from the house at 219 North Delaware downtown, he began to say she is going to survive this. So in the midst of all the uncertainty with COVID that we're in and in, on the West Coast where I am with the fires, uh, it reminds us that other generations, other Americans, uh, other people of the world have been through tough times like we're going through. I, I've wanted to write about Harry Truman and I was really influenced by David McCullough at the Wild About Harry, I think 2017, if I'm not mistaken. And McCullough was so passionate that night in saying, oh, how we need a Harry Truman these days. And last week I was going through some old research articles I had not really read, and I found one from 1995 where Donald McCullough said the following, I don't think we'll ever uh, know enough about Harry Truman. I don't think we'll ever know enough about Harry Truman. And thinking back that night at Wild About Harry and then seeing this note, I wanted to do a book, but I didn't want to do a book like the traditional kinds of books, you know, chapter after chapter after chapter. Cause quite frankly, um, people's reading attention is not what they used to be when Harry Truman would read books until late at night and best would read mysteries. Uh, so I thought and thought, what's a way? And I spent uh, three years teaching in the inner city and learned how to do exams and multiple choice questions. And so this idea just came to me, why not do a book of Truman facts and put it in multiple choice questions? And so I started, well, let's just try a few. And so I tried a few. And then I began to realize, well, you got to tighten the question. 
You don't want to give away the answer because there are going to be various levels of comprehension. For example, there are going to be people, some perhaps in the audience tonight, who know a lot about Harry Truman. So how do you have a book that appeals to them, also to people who don't know a lot about Harry Truman? Or, as I have met in my travels across the country, people who know the myths about Harry Truman. Well, my granddaddy's neighbor told me one time, well, what did he tell you? And it's astounded me, some of the myths I've listened to, and to be courteous to individuals, to say, well, now let me tell you what I know for a fact, or what the research says, or what the literature says. And uh, some people almost still want to go away with that myth. Well, my granddaddy told me that. He always said this about Harry Truman. Well, I don't want to say your granddaddy was wrong, but he probably was. Um, and also, it's important because Harry Truman left the White House with, in 1953, January was such low, low poll rating, something like 23%. And he believed in the long of history, not just the short part of history, but the long haul. He really believed that in time, the good he had done would come to be seen and evaluated. And sure enough, it has. And now Harry Truman was most recently ranked six. And uh, people at another presidential library, which I won't mention, uh, just carried on and carried on because their individual was number five. And I don't have hair to pull out, but I was wondering, how is that possible their president could have beat out Harry Truman? And so I went through the research, looking and looking, and then I discovered that the voting was so close by historians that it was not statistically significant. So yes, there's another president who is now in fifth place, and Harry has dropped to sixth, but who knows how that's going to change in the future. So I wanted a book using the multiple choice questions, and yet I knew that people would question me going, well, I don't think that's the answer. Because one thing I have learned, David McCullough wrote his magnum opus, Truman, uh, and published it in 1992, which was 28 years ago. There may be some people in the audience who are not 28 years old. And so through the skills and the persistence of the Truman Presidential Library, constantly new materials are being opened. So I've had access to some materials that David McCullough did not have. And so that's why I decided in the book that I would have at least two or three answers, uh, uh, sources to back up any answer. Now, I only put one generally in the uh, answer column, but I was prepared to say, no, I went and looked at different sources to say this is what the correct answer is. Uh, in this uh, system, though, I decided I wanted to do just a little musing thing and have all, you know, four correct answers within one section. And so I don't want to throw people off, but I do want to make it interesting. And I am really hopeful that as much as people need to know about what a great man Harry Truman was. Now, I, I, I'm snickering a bit because I grew up in a diehard Republican party uh, family, and uh, I am sure uh, it's a good thing my parents have gone on to their eternal reward, because I'm sure my mother would be asking, what possessed you to write a book about that man? Because uh, my mother was just very clear in her opinions when I was growing up that Harry Truman just used such salty language that little children should not listen to that kind of thing. So that's one reason I, I wanted to do a book that's different. The book is, <coughs> excuse me, 600 questions, multiple choice, covering all aspects, really from close to birth, down in Lamar, all the way through when he died at Christmas of 1972, and they could not do the rituals as had been outlined because Bess was just too frail. I also want to say a major thank you because a book has many components to the wonderful archivist at the Truman Library who I'm sure I sometimes ask questions that cause them to roll their eyes 
or you know what does this mean and sometimes i didn't fully understand the background and those archivists were always so good explaining well this person was this person's friend i'm also so grateful for the incredible oral histories that the Truman possesses. All these individuals, many of whom are dead now, but who knew Truman, who worked for him, in some cases people that had gone to school with him, and that all of these are online. So tonight, for example, you could take some name in the book and go to the oral histories in the Truman Presidential Library and download them, and just read some of them are lengthy some like clark clifford who was his top advisor one of his top aides were on five or six hundred pages but then there are the people who were with him in battery d in france there were the people who were with him with the AAA auto club when harry sold memberships and did very well selling memberships and so those resources are so critically important and they're so accessible particularly during this coronavirus when people cannot go you use the research rooms at any of the presidential libraries to my knowledge and yet the truman has worked so diligently to put so many of these resources online also a shout out to two people who really made the book happen uh, first of all mary Kay speaks who lives in independence and jack martin uh, mary Kay was the editor and there were times uh, I would get an email back, uh, I don't think this is the correct answer, or when I checked this, I did not find this answer. And sometimes she questioned me about the phrasing of the questions, that the question could be misleading. It made sense to me, but Mary's careful editorship said, let's make this question crisp. And then for Jack Martin, who's the graphic artist, who did all the things, I can't explain how he did it with these multiple choice. And uh, they did a marvelous job. And so I really wanna give them great appreciation. Thanks for me. And so uh, I think that's what I wanted to say. I'm gonna come back toward the end with a particular slide I want you to see. But I'd like us to try some of the questions out of the book and just see what you come up with. All right, folks, we thank you, Harold Ivan, for writing this fascinating book and curating some special questions just for our trivia night. We'll now dive into the trivia portion of the evening. We won't be tracking points tonight. We're playing for bragging rights only. So we'll be using the polling feature for the trivia. A question will appear on your screen. Choose the answer or answers that you think are correct and click submit. We'll allow a short period of time to collect answers for each question before closing the poll and revealing the correct answer. So we'll go ahead and launch our first poll here. All right. So the first poll, what did Martha Truman instill in her son, Harry? The love of reading, always do the right thing, the love of music, particularly the piano, that some people were too religious to have as neighbors. And we'll give everybody a little bit of time to vote for the answers that they think are correct before we close it here. All right, we'll give it about 20 more seconds here to get those last few votes in. All right, we're gonna go ahead and close the poll and we'll share the results. Wow. Okay, I can respond to the question, right? Yes, well, please go ahead and tell us the correct uh, answer. Uh, actually, every one of you had the correct answer, or at least one of the correct answers. Uh, this is a fun question I created. All four answers are correct. Uh, the love of reading. Uh, since Harry had eye issues, uh, he couldn't play the rough sports that other boys got to play, couldn't do roughhousing. And so she was very clear about 
reading. And she gave me one of those great uh, uh, multiple volumes, four volumes, I believe it was, History of Persons, uh, Personalities, a biography. And Harry read those and it really opened his eyes to people who had made the world different. Also the love of music. Oh man, uh, five o'clock in the morning, almost every day, Harry Truman was up practicing piano. And his mother went a long ways, even taking him to lessons in downtown Kansas City, so he would have that opportunity. Uh, also, um, the do the right thing. And that answer prevailed in Harry Truman's mind throughout his life. Uh, Martha Truman died in 1947, and Harry Truman was quite broken by the experience because he knew that his mother was there for him. And I maintain that his mother may have been the only other person who believed he could win in 1948. And she had said, well, you know, I'm glad you're president, but it's too bad FDR had to die in order for you to be president. But I'd like to see you win in your own right. And he dearly loved his mother. And he wrote a quote that I have used with, for many people who are grieving for the death of mothers, that it doesn't matter how old a boy is, he always needs his mother. And Harry Truman is exactly right about that. And then Martha believed that some people were just too religious to have as neighbors. And she marched herself out of the uh, Grandview Baptist Church and that was just pretty much it for the church. Uh, she said it was full of hypocrites and that she was a light-footed Baptist. And Harry said he was, uh, that they liked to play cards and they liked to dance. And Harry Truman just thought God didn't have any great reasons to be opposed to that. So all of you got a good, correct answer, uh, but an incredible mother, an incredible mother was Martha Truman. Wonderful. All right, we are gonna launch the second poll, our second trivia question. How did Harry Truman dodge an incoming German shell in World War I that might have been fatal? Moved his tent just before the shell landed, traded command posts with another captain, raided the mess hall for a midnight snack, played a poker game with fellow officers. Again, we'll allow about a minute for responses. So 30 seconds left about. Ten seconds left. Get those answers in if you haven't already. All right, we'll go ahead and share the results and Harold Ivan can tell us what the right answer is. Okay, 20% uh, said he moved his tent just before the shell landed. 21% traded command posts with another captain, uh, raided the mess hall for a midnight snack, and then played a poker game with fellow officers. And I'm sure that last answer uh, is probably triggered by the fact so many people know he was a fabulous poker player. Now, he never let people lose money, a lot of money, but nevertheless, he was quite the poker player. But the actual answer is, for some reason, he moved the tent. Uh, Harry Truman was a great fatalist. He believed when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. And yet, he had Bass back in Independence, so he wasn't quite ready to go. And for some reason that night, he decided to move the tent. And if he had not moved that tent, how the world would be so radically different. Um, so the correct answer was number A, that he moved the tent just before the shell landed. Excellent, we'll move on to question number three. All right, what was Bess's twist on Harry Truman's maxim, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen? Move to Alaska or Minnesota? Kitchen, Harry Truman hasn't been in a kitchen more than to make toast. If it's too hot for me, I'll get back to the kitchen. 
If you can't stand the heat, then crank up the air conditioning. About 30 seconds left to get your answers in for this third question. Ten second warning, get those answers in if you haven't already. All right, we'll stop the poll and share the results here. Oh, wow. 78% Harry hasn't been in the kitchen more than to make breakfast. If it's too hot for me, I'll get back to the kitchen. And if you can't stand the heat, then crank up the air conditioning. Well, the correct answer is, if it's too hot for me, I'll get back, I'll get back to the kitchen. Uh, there is a famous picture of Harry and Bess when he was a senator, and uh, Bess's hair, you, you just have to say, okay, that's the way women fix their hair in the 30s. Um, but there was a picture of them that appeared, uh, Harry making toast. So I thought some people might have seen that picture. Uh, neither Harry nor Bess liked air conditioning. They really did not. And uh, so that couldn't have been the answer. But the actual answer is, if it gets too hot, I'll go back to the kitchen. Uh, you know, Bess was an uh, incredible lady, but she had to follow the very activist Eleanor Roosevelt, and she fretted about that. She really didn't have time to think about it. It just kind of happened. And so um, they wanted to know if she's going to continue the press conferences. And she had one press conference, and she announced there would be no more press conferences. And Bess would often point out that Harry was the president. He was the public servant. She was merely his wife and the mother of his daughter, Margaret. There was a wonderful episode um, because reporters were calling one day asking what she was going to wear to a particular event. And her answer was succinct, none of your damned business. And she hung up the phone. <laughs> now, I'm not sure she became more diplomatic after that. But there was some heat, and she did take some heat, and uh, her thing was, I'll just go back to the kitchen. I will say this, uh, Harry Truman could make a wonderful breakfast. Uh, there were field hands who worked for the Trumans who said he could make incredible biscuits, and often he made the breakfast before everybody headed to the fields, and uh, he was quite good at that. I've never heard of him grilling or doing anything like that, but he did make good breakfast. All right, let's try another question. Okay, well on the next poll, so our fourth trivia question. During Harry Truman's 1940 re-election campaign, when he was unable to attract campaign donations, what did he do? Borrowed on his life insurance, occasionally slept in his car, held a radio fundraiser, accepted a large check from Bernard Baruch, Fifteen seconds to get those answers in for the what you think is correct. Okay, we will go ahead and end the poll and share the results. And Harold Ivan can tell us what the correct answer is. Okay. Um, well, the answer is that he borrowed on his life insurance. Uh, that he did occasionally sleep in his car, and that he accepted a large check from Bernard Baruch. Uh, one thing you have to remember is this is before air conditioning, and sleeping in your car in Missouri in the summertime during the primary, uh, it's just unbelievable that he could do that. Uh, and I don't know how he did it, because there would have been perspiration, yet you see pictures of him. He was in a crisp white shirt, 
the next day. It did bother him to have to take the check from Bernard Baruch because his belief was that Baruch was kind of like the camel getting his nose into the tent. If he gave you something, he wanted something in return for it. But at that point, he was so stressed. Um, and I should also tell you that nobody believed he could win in 40. And he looked and looked to get someone to be the campaign treasurer. Nobody wanted to even be the treasurer because they said there's not going to be any money coming in. And yet Harry Truman got in that car and drove all over Missouri. And he'd show up in those courthouse towns and talk to people. And uh, he won that 1940 race and sent him on his way uh, to the future. But um, he did have a lot of nights sleeping in that car. And uh, I don't know if Bess knew about him borrowing on his life insurance, but of course with a young daughter, that would have been very concerning to her. Yeah. All right, fifth question. We're halfway through. What did FDR forbid Harry Truman to do during the 1944 campaign? Travel by airplane? Make any large personal purchases? Criticize the Roosevelt sons? Voice enthusiasm for civil rights in any way? About halfway through our time, another 30 seconds until we close the poll. All right, we'll go ahead and end this poll. And we'll share the results so Harold Ivan can tell us the right answer. Okay. Um, it's actually travel by airplane. That's a very good suggestion and very good answer. I'll talk about the others, uh, possible answers. But uh, remember that the uh, air flying was pretty dangerous in those days. And uh, Roosevelt told him, one of us has to stay alive. So don't fly. Uh, he also, there was concern about, I mean, there could have been concern about making purchases because they were trying to dig up dirt on Harry. There were reporters all over Independence trying to find people who could, you know, really come up with something. Um, the third thing is uh, the Roosevelt boys uh, were an object of great criticism. Uh, with their exploits, their, the Roosevelt boys had, I think, 17 marriages among them. And this was in an era when divorce was pretty rare. And sometimes Eleanor didn't know that they had divorced, which created problems. Uh, but Harry had no use for those boys because he really believed they felt they were entitled. And that continued once Harry became president because he would not endorse them in their political campaigns. And uh, one of them, Harry finally poked his finger in Jimmy Roosevelt's chest and said, now let's get one thing straight. I didn't ask to be the vice president and become president. It was because your dad asked me. And so let's get this very clear. I didn't, and matter of fact, two of the Roosevelt boys uh, tried to recruit Dwight Eisenhower to run in 48. And so Harry Truman just made it very, very clear that he felt like the Roosevelt boys just were too entitled uh, to what their name, and their name did open, incredible doors. I concede, I concede that. So the correct answer was don't fly, do not fly. All right, question number six. What did almost one in four Americans believe about the atomic bomb? It should have been used earlier. The United States should have dropped many more atomic bombs on Japan before the surrender. Should have been dropped on Germany. It should never have been used.
Another 20 seconds before we close the poll. Okay, we'll end the poll. We'll share these results and Harold Ivan, take it away. Okay, uh, should have been used earlier. Actually, it could not have been used earlier because there were only two atomic bombs and uh, they actually were not sure either one was going to go off to work. And that's why they didn't notify and give a demonstration of the bomb's effect uh, to the Germans. Uh, there was an idea, I mean, excuse me, the Japanese, there was an idea that was developed by the Japanese that Truman had hundreds of atomic bombs and would not stop using them until there was nothing left of Japan. Uh, the actual answer is 25% uh, of Americans believed uh, we should have dropped more atomic bombs. Uh, actually, Senator Richard Russell of Georgia was one of the strongest advocates of just bombing them out of existence. And he said, no more talk about surrender, no more talk about peace plans. The only thing we're gonna do is when there's nothing left of Japan and they are going to beg us. Uh, and Richard Russell was a very prominent Southern Senator and he really believed that. Uh, there is the question, would it have been used on Germany uh, because there was a belief that German, Germans were developing an atomic bomb, and that's kind of things you can talk about and argue about. The last one, um, that it should never have been used, this is really is a revisionist question that was developed years after World War I. Uh, I'm writing a, a book for 2022 on Harry Truman's faith. And one of the elements is his use of the atomic bomb. And so I have spent a lot of time wrestling with the data and trying to make sense of it. But you have to realize that we had had a bloodbath in Okinawa and Iwo Jima. And it was believed uh, that there would be hundreds of thousands of boys, American boys, die if we had to invade Japan. Uh, Truman was pretty well convinced that the Japanese would fight to the last person. They had something like 5,000 planes uh, where they were able to predict where the Americans were going to invade, 5,000 kamikaze planes that they intended to crash into the U.S. Uh, military ve vehicles. Um, people wanted the war over. They wanted their sons, their brothers, their husbands, their uncles home. Uh, there was a lot of Asian prejudice that we didn't have against the Germans um, because they were Oriental. And as Harry Truman said, because they started it with the savage attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, there has been a whole industry of historians that have tried to convince um, uh, people that, yes, we shouldn't have used that bomb, that Japan was almost defeated, da, 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 da. Or some have argued that we were trying to warn the Russians not to come into the war because we had an atomic bomb. Uh, I just need to say that the research is pretty clear that um, a lot of Americans wanted the atomic bomb used in Korea, and there was a proposal for a hundred atomic bombs to be dropped on the Soviet Union. The idea is we're eventually gonna fight them, so let's go ahead and use our nuclear advantage and just destroy the Soviet Union. Uh, and luckily, Harry Truman thought that was an absolutely insane idea. Uh, I just want to tell a quick story. Uh, I was in the Truman Library, and some of you may not know, there's one quarter that has these large photographs of Harry Truman. And Rosalind Carter was there, and we were in a line waiting to meet her. And uh, the man in front of me, an older man, was staring at this one picture, and then he started crying. And his wife said, what are you crying about? I was standing behind them, 
And he raised his finger and pointed to that picture and said, if it wasn't for that man, I wouldn't be in this world. And she said, what are you talking about? He said, I was scheduled to go to the Pacific and I would have been one of those soldiers wading into Japan. I would never have come home to meet you. I would never have married you and had our children and had such a wonderful life. I'm here because of that man. And those stories are legion. The number of people who said, yes, it was devastating, but at the same time, it brought our sons home. And it brought many of our sons home whole with their arms and their legs and their sight. And it still is a controversial question. I admit that. But um, it's been awful easy for some people to blame President Truman. But I, I noticed several weeks ago when um, uh, uh, Chris Wallace was there at the Truman did the Zoom, he was very clear in saying he really had no other choices. But the U.S. had spent $2 billion. And if we had invaded Japan, hundreds of thousands, or even 20,000 killed. And then Americans had found out we had this bomb and we had spent $2 billion of taxpayers' money money to develop and hadn't used it, Harry Truman said I would have been impeached. Okay. All right, question number seven. As president, how many words did Harry Truman read a day? 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, as many words as needed to be read. All right, another 20 seconds to get those votes in if you haven't already. All right, we will go ahead and close this poll. It looks like we had a landslide popular result this time. I'll put it up here and Harold Ivan, you can let oh, us know. Wow. Uh, wow, as many words as needed to be read. Well, there's a way in which that could be an answer, but the correct answer was the average was 30,000 words a day. And, and a couple of things you need to remember that uh, Harry Truman really had troubled eyesight. If he didn't have his glasses on, he was basically blind. When he went to World War I, he took five pair of glasses with him in case he lost a pair or a pair was broken. Uh, I need to be very clear that he read more than any of our other presidents. He read widely, but uh, Harry Truman read the fine print. And there were people who were trying to pull things over the president's eyes, assuming he hadn't read it all. And so they would come in and Harry Truman would say, you know, I read your memorandum. Now, I want to ask you about this item, page 16, line 9. I, I don't understand that. And people go, uh, uh, page 16. Well, uh, let's see what page 16 is. And they were, uh, well, well, well. Uh, and then the word got out, Harry Truman reads what you put in front of him. Uh, J.B. West, who was the chief White House usher, said you could count on at 9 o'clock every night Harry Truman would pick up his briefcase, take Bess by the uh, arm and say, that would be all, that will be all to the staff. And then they'd go upstairs and he would sometimes read till midnight, but page after page. And from his days as, a, as county judge, he understood how to read numbers and when numbers did not add up. And uh, so, it, but he did love to read history he loved to read biography. Uh, and several people have told me who are older, but were living in independence when Mr. Truman was still alive. They could come down uh, Truman Road, I forget what it was called in those days, and they would see the light on in, um, 
in President Truman's study. And there was the soliloquy of him reading. Uh, one time in New York, a reporter came to the hotel to interview him, and there was a stack of new books. And they said, well, Mr. President, do you read to read yourself to sleep? And he was irked and said, no, young man, I read myself to be alert. <laughs> and uh, that was really him. I mean, he read and read, uh, and he could remember what he read. That was one of the things that stunned a lot of people. And more than one person said, we kind of smirked, well, he's wrong about that. And then we went to check, and sure enough, he was right. Yeah. Excellent. We have three questions left in our trivia. We'll launch question number eight here. Advised that 1948 was not the year to push civil rights, how did Harry Truman respond? There has never been a better time than 1948. It's not about pushing civil rights. It is about giving Americans their constitutional rights. I'm going to try to remedy it, and if that ends up in my failure to be reelected, that failure will be in a good cause. The president is supposed to do the right thing, not the convenient thing. Another 10 seconds here for answers. We're still getting a few answers, so I'll give you all a few more seconds here. The answers were a little bit longer this time. Okay, we'll go ahead and end polling, share the results, and Harold Ivan can tell us what's the right answer. Okay. Uh, well, actually, uh, it is the third answer. I'm going to try to remit it, and if that ends up my failure to be reelected, that failure will be for a good cause. Actually, Truman wrote those words, and I'm blanking on the man's name. He had been in Harry's Battery D, and he wrote him a letter, and it went along the effects of, now, Harry, what are you dealing with all this for? we in the South now know how to take care of this issue. And Harry Truman wrote back and said, you know, it's people like you who are living a hundred years behind the time. The man had also told Harry that, you know, Mrs. Truman will not live with you if you try to pass this civil rights. And uh, Harry Truman was not impressed with that. Uh, he was deeply troubled and I spent time today writing about this, by the number of African-American soldiers, about 890,000 served in World War I, or two, excuse me. And when they came home, they went, we have fought and died for our country. Uh, we ought to be able to be full citizens. And of course, uh, 31 men were lynched, uh, some wearing uh, their army uniform, uh, one, uh, Woodard, was dragged off a bus in South Carolina wearing his uniform. He'd been dismissed from the army about six hours earlier and was bl blinded by the sheriff's blackjack. And Harry Truman went totally nuts on that. What kind of America are we dealing with? Uh, there was also a busload uh, um, a truckload, rather, of U.S. Army soldiers, African-American, who were dragged off Army trucks in Mississippi and beaten severely. And the answer was, you may have gone off, but we're going to teach you your place. And Harry Truman was much a Southern influence, but his point was, they fought for this country. They have every right to their full civil rights. Now, he was quick to say, I'm not talking about intermarriage, as it was called in those days, but they have the right to vote. And he was really incensed when one of those soldiers said, I have a right to all my constitutional rights, voted south of Atlanta and was shot to death uh, the day after the election when he answered the door of his home. And that sent Harry into a rage, an absolute rage. And he created the Commission on Civil Rights. The Department of Justice started filing friend of court briefs. 
Um, and he didn't do everything everybody wanted him to do, but he did stretch. And he really believed that if he lost in 48 because of civil rights, then he had lost for a good cause. All right, second to last question here. Question number nine. What popular religious figure did Harry Truman ban from the White House? Norman Vincent Peale, Francis Cardinal Spellman, Monsignor Fulton Sheen, Billy Graham. All right, another 15 seconds to get your answers in on this question. And we'll go ahead and end this poll and share our results and take it away, Harold Evan. Okay, let's see. Norma Vincent Peale, actually Dr. Peale, had not reached his uh, influence yet. That would come in 1960 when he uh, campaigned against Jack Kennedy. Uh, Francis Cardinal Spellman, uh, Truman kind of had an interesting relationship with Francis Cardinal Spellman because he was such a power broker in uh, New York. Uh, Monsignor Fulton Sheen, actually, uh, I don't think Fulton Sheen at that point had quite become the popular uh, bishop uh, yet, but he had a great TV presence. But the actual answer is Billy Graham. And uh, that's very fascinating because I still read statements that, saying, that say Billy Graham has counseled every president since the end of World War II. Now, uh, Truman <laughs> uh, was not big on evangelist. He was very much a believer in you live what you believe. Yeah, revivals, but he said revivals rarely change anybody permanently. It's the Sermon on the Mount that changes people. So Billy Graham and three associate evangelists came to the White House to uh, see Mr. Truman for an interview. And they came in rainbow colored suits, lime green, red sorbet, uh, and these buckskin shoes and all this. Now, Truman the haberdasher takes one look at them and goes, oh my Lord. So they start talking and Billy Graham had an agenda. He wanted Truman to come to the crusade so they could get pictures of him walking into the crusade and saying that he was supporting Billy Graham. Uh, so uh, then Billy Graham asked, President Truman, point blank, have, are you saved? Have, are you a born-again Christian? And Truman responded by saying, I try to live by the Sermon on the Mount and the Ten Commandments. He didn't say, I lived, I try to live. Very humble. And Billy Graham says, well, there's more to it than that. And Harry Truman stood to announce their time uh, was done. Well, then Billy Graham says, well, can we pray before we leave? And Truman goes, well, I don't think it could hurt anything. So they had this prayer and they had already used up their time in delaying the next appointment. Well, they went out on, on the White House lawn and all the reporters were there. And what would you talk about? And Billy Graham later said, I made a fool of myself that day. Uh, I told them exactly what the president said. And then they said they prayed with him. And so the reporters asked, well, would you show us how you, so here are these four Billy Graham evangelists in their rainbow suits, and Billy Graham himself said, looking like a bunch of clowns, knelt to demonstrate this prayer. And that was the front page of the Washington Post. Harry Truman blew a gasket, and he called Billy Graham a faker. And he was permanently banned from the White House. Now, he and Eisenhower were big buds. And Billy Graham was involved in politics, getting Truman the nomination in 1952. Uh, but to Billy Graham's credit, 
late in Mr. Truman's life, he came to Independence to see President Truman and to apologize. And Truman was so gracious, he said, well, you know, I just considered the circumstances that nobody had probably, you know, prepared you for how you have meetings in the White House, what's off topic, that you don't go out and tell what the president just said. And so the two men die, uh, both of them really died with a good attitude toward each other. But uh, Graham turned very radical in 1950 against uh, Harry Truman. Um, and it was ugly. Uh, a minister of the gospel should not have gone there. But Billy Graham did, and I've just read some of the transcripts, and uh, oh my, he said some things he definitely should not have said about Harry Truman. Uh, but late in life, they made up. So there you have it. it and they all lived happily or ever after. All right, we have come to our ultimate question for our trivia night. How did Harry Truman assess the duties of the president? The president is a glorified public relations man who spends his time flattering, kissing, and kicking people to get them to do what they are supposed to do anyway. It's an all-day and nearly all-night job. The president has to act for whatever is for the best of the country. The man in the White House represents 150 million people who can't afford a lobbyist. All right, just 20 more seconds left to get your answer in on this final question for our Truman Trivia. All right, we will close this final poll and share the results. Harold Ivan, tell us what the correct answer is. Uh, actually, the correct answer, in Truman's words, was the first one. The president is a glorified public relations man who spends time flattering, kissing, and kicking people to get them to do what they're supposed to do. Um, but the second answer is the reality of Truman experience. It's a, nearly an all-day and nearly all-night job. Uh, Truman would not go to bed most nights before midnight, uh, sometimes long after midnight in certain crises, but he was always up at six the next day. Um, uh, he, he would say, uh, even though this was not the answer that I can back up with research, that the man who is president is supposed to represent all Americans, especially those who cannot afford a lobbyist. And that was particularly true uh, with African Americans. Uh, he really believed they had very little power and nevertheless that that's why he had to be involved in civil rights. And not just for African Americans, but for any non-white. Uh, in 1950, they were getting ready to bury a man who had won the Bronze Star in Korea, was killed and it was in Sioux City, Iowa, and they're getting ready to put him in the ground, and they discover that he was a member of the Winnebago tribe, and they would not bury him. And Harry Truman went ballistic, saying he won the Bronze Star. He died for his country. So Harry Truman had the body flown to Washington and had him buried at Arlington National Cemetery with full military honors. But Harry Truman just said, nobody can lobby that way, so I have to represent the American people. All right, thank you, Harold Ivan, for sharing these Truman facts with us. Uh, if you have a question and haven't added it to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, please do so now. You can also like a question that's already been submitted that you would like to see answered. And we have a few questions in here already. So Robin asks, what fact did you learn about Harry Truman that surprised you the most? You know, actually, uh, it was that um, he was such a believer in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Uh, I, you know, it's one thing he was a Baptist and he read the Bible through when he was a child. 
But he believed to the core of his being that whatever religion you were in, if you would follow the tenets of the Sermon on the Mount, you could live at peace with other people. Uh, and he said that repeatedly. Matter of fact, he tried to say that to a group of reporters and they're going, what's the Sermon on the Mount? Where, where did that happen? And Harry Truman rolled his eyes, knowing some people don't know much. And one reporter said, well, Mr. President, you have to understand of us, some of us don't know the Bible. And Harry Truman said, I'm not gonna answer you then. You go read this. And he said, you might need to read it a hundred times to understand it, but you come back and we'll talk about it. But you know, he believed in those essentials of kindness and that he wanted to be known as a seeker after peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. He loved that verse. And this really surprised me. Uh, and he kept Bibles, he read in different translations, he read the Koran, um, he was very familiar with Mormon uh, uh, sources of, of, of sacred text, and that was a big surprise to me, because sometimes there are politicians who quote a verse of scripture, or they'll go, well, as the good book says. And uh, Harry Truman just asked one senator, where in the good book does it say you can treat African-Americans in your state like this? Where does it say that? And they go, well, uh, it's in there somewhere. And Harry Truman said, no, 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 that won't work. You tell me where it is. It was really surprising, you know. Uh, it also surprised me that the Trumans had several pianos in the uh, White House and he and Margaret will often play duets. And when he went to the Washington Symphony, he took the scores, if it was Mozart or Chopin, and he would sit there following the text, these big music scores, to make sure they were playing it correctly. Excellent. All right, our next question comes from Frank, and I think this one's more for me than for you, Harold Ivan. And Frank is asking, if the li will the library offer a signed copy of the book? And I don't know the answer to that question, but I will look into it for you, and we'll get back to you, Frank. Okay, our next question comes from Robin. Robin asks, do you have enough material for a second book? Uh, yes, I do. Um, and you know, uh, I have to admit that we went back and forth. I selected some questions and then the Truman Institute staff narrowed them down to just 10. Because when there are 600 questions, uh, you know, it's like asking a mother of nine children, which one of your children is your favorite? And even this afternoon, flipping back through the book, I was going, oh, well, that's a good question we should have used. Oh, that question is good, too. Uh, I'm committed to doing the book on Truman's spirituality uh, because he did have a deep faith. And people go, well, he cussed and he drank bourbon. Well, yes, he did, but he loved his neighbor as himself. And, uh, you know, uh, he had a deep spirituality. He wasn't pious. But if you're down in Grandview ever and you drive by the First Baptist Church in Grandview, take a look at that because it is on that corner because Harry Truman said it needed to be on that corner where people could see it and get to it. And Harry Truman gave far beyond his income uh, to help see that church was built. I do not know where he came up with the money that he gave, but he gave more than 10% of the cost of building First Baptist Church in Grandview, because where he was a member. He was a member from, say, 1914 till, until his death. Yeah. Um, so I, that book is committed. And so then maybe if people think uh, some more questions we ought to ask, uh, we'll come up with that. All right, we have time for a few more questions and Susan asks, did you find any interesting similarities between Eleanor Roosevelt and Harry Truman? Yes, uh, very surprising. They both believed in uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt repeatedly said, if people would just live by this, uh, she went so far to say all the problems in the world would be solved. Harry Truman didn't go quite that far because he said he thought it'd be hard for some labor union people to live by the Sermon on the Mount um, against management. 
but they did. They both believed in the treatment of all people with dignity, all people with dignity. Now, they had their differences at times because Eleanor uh, didn't think he could win in 48, and quite frankly, she thought he would pull the entire ticket down everywhere, Senate, House, local officers, and she did not come out for him till late in the campaign in 48. Uh, but uh, they did believe in the UN. They both desperately believed there needed to be a place where people could work for peace, where internationals could talk, and that they could create this sense. And really, without Eleanor and Harry Truman, I doubt there would have been a United Nations, as we know it, that emerged. Um, um, Harry Truman wasn't much for women's rights. I will say that, and Eleanor pushed him because she thought it was time for a woman Supreme Court justice uh, and some of those things. But nevertheless, uh, they were allies, uh, very much allies. And there were times Eleanor just called him up. I'm going to resign. No, Mrs. Rose, no, 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 Mrs. Rose, we can't do that. You can't do that. And so they would have to work through some of their differences but she wasn't going to just take anything he said. So they had their differences, but they were agreed on more than they disagreed on. They both agreed deeply that John Kennedy was too young to run in 1960. They both believed that sternly. Harry Truman did not go to the Democratic National uh, Convention in Los Angeles because he said it's rigged for young Kennedy. Uh, Eleanor went, but that was the last time she ever appeared at a uh, Democratic convention. All right, our last question comes from Betty, and this ties in perfectly with some closing remarks I know you wanted to make, Harold Ivan. So Betty asks, you mentioned his field hands. Will you please say more about his relationship with them? Thanks for the most informative and engaging webinar. Thank you. Well, you know, uh, it was so amazing that Harry Truman began on a farm and uh, he, um, he went back to the farm. This is the picture I most love. I, I wish we could have billboards, especially these days, so that you know the background. Harry Truman had uh, been a student, college student, uh, admittedly in a business program uh, in New York and Kansas City. He worked as an usher at the major theaters for music. He was a, a bank teller, and he had all this going, the good life. He was making incredible money for a person without a college degree in that time. But 1906, he was called to come back to the farm to help his father run the farm. And Harry Truman gave up all the life in Kansas City to go back to the farm. And this picture is so important because his father died and then Harry Truman realized this was permanent. He would never have another opportunity uh, other than following mules through a field down in Grandview. And I went down to Grandview to walk some of that land. And if you had walked beside Harry Truman and had said, uh, Mr. Truman, uh, do you know you're going to be uh, in World War I? Uh, do you realize you're going to be the uh, the judge of Jackson County. Do you realize you're going to be a U.S. Senator, uh, a vice president? If you had said all of this to Harry Truman on those hot days, following those mules, when he was getting up early to deal with the pigs and all those things that he did, that day this picture was taken, he could not have believed any had any other future than following teams of mules and being a farmer. But he was destined for great things because of the deep reality of who he was. And there may be some people today watching this who have known better days. Uh, they're in a lull. Their job is gone. They're not going to get another job like they had. Their finances are shot. Uh, or else they're doing a job they absolutely hate or dislike. And I hope something in this picture will speak to you because uh, one of my friends wrote a line that I dearly love. If we're still breathing, it's too early to tell the ultimate impact of any event in our lives. 
Harry Truman was to dance with the Queen of England. He was to meet with prime ministers, all these things that he did, but he could not have believed it those days when this picture was taken. So Harry Truman would say to you, do your best on your job, whatever it is, and yet dare to believe in a future. And that's what I so much love about Harry Truman. He says to us, you know, yeah, tough time right now during this COVID business. That's what Harry would say. But there are going to be good days ahead. Do your job. Do it well. Love your fellow man. Be kind to people who are not of the same skin color as you and dare to believe in a future. And he found that future when he married Bess. And life really got good for him. So that's what I would tell you, you know, and I hope you'll get the book on Amazon and that you'll just try some of these questions and uh, the, the type that jar your mind. One last thing, very last thing is one thing that amazes me, we're still dealing with some of the issues Harry Truman dealt with in 1950, Korea. I don't think he could have imagined a Korea that with nuclear armament. Uh, we're still dealing with issues at the United Nations. We're still struggling over NATO uh, and our commitment to NATO. Um, we're still dealing with some of the same issues he dealt with 75 years after he became president. But he offers us a chance to say, do the right thing, which he learned from his mother. Excellent. Thank you all for joining us today and special thanks to Harold Ivins Thank for you. this excellent and interactive presentation. Don't forget, tomorrow is the last day to order a limited edition 75th anniversary Truman teaser made by Kansas City's own Charlie Hustle. Proceeds support the Truman Library Institute's Stay Through Capital Campaign. Visit our website at trumanlibraryinstitute.org to purchase your Truman shirt and support his presidential library. To find more information about future programs commemorating the 75th anniversary of Truman's presidency, like the ones listed here, be sure to follow the Truman Library Institute on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. For more Truman trivia, Harold Ivan Smith's Almost Everything Worth Knowing about Harry S. Truman can be purchased on Amazon. Thanks again, Harold Ivan, and thanks Thank everyone for coming tonight. Good night. <laughs>